Hey, this that thanks. You sure? Uh, yeah. Username? Ooh, uh, Nick M? No. NM1983? No. I, uh, Zandy Pops? Sorry. <clears throat> Zandy Pops? No, OK. Don't worry, I'll help. What's your postcode? Oh, it's uh, GU749ZT. Welcome back, Nick, forever. Oh, okay. Please listen carefully to this bread licence agreement before continuing with your purchase of a loaf of bread. If you do not, blah, blah, blah. You also agree not to use any bread-based products for any purposes prohibited by United Kingdom law, including without limitation of design, development, manufacture of missiles, chemical, nuclear or biological weapons. Tick. I'm afraid you've timed out. What? Sorry. Hello? Excuse me. Oh, yeah, hey. Just one loaf, sir. Yeah, we just... What's your username? It's uh, Nick Forever, but number four, not the... Gotcha. Yeah. OK, I'm just going to check that you're a real person. Could you say that for me? That's not even a word. OK, how about this one? You know what, forget it. it, it or really... this one? Uh, Hippopotter mice. You're in. Great, I'm in. £8.85. It's supposed to be 98 pence. Plus express delivery. What's that? Oh, well, it's express delivery. It's fast. So there's, um... Standard. Oh, standard. Standard delivery. That's four pounds ninety nine. Why? Bread insurance. You didn't untick the don't decline bread insurance option. You know what? I think I'll risk it. It is quite close to the sell by date. Don't care. Ninety eight pence it is. If you want to pop back in five business days, it'll be ready for your collection. Well, well, well I need it now, obviously. Oh, okay. Uh, you want the take home today price? Well, that's three pounds twenty seven. You know what? I'm going to go. Come back soon. I won't. That's a video by Google Analytics. And it's probably one of the biggest and most important um, tips I would give this morning, kicking things off, is you need a dashboard. If you think about it, I'd say out of the people that are in the room, 90% or more know how to drive a car. But can you imagine driving your car without a dashboard? How would that make you feel? You have no idea how fast you're going, how far you've traveled, how much fuel you've left in the tank. You know that little yellow light that comes on? Will I make it? Imagine having that feeling all the time when you've no dashboard in your car. Or worse still, red lights. Your dashboard is trying to send you a little red light to say, stop. Your, your engine's about to explode. We see so many people set up an online presence, a website, social media, and no dashboard. No way of measuring what's working, what's not working. And Google Analytics on your website gives you far more information than you'll ever need, but it helps identify a customer journey. Now, we're going to make this as interactive as possible. So um, later on, I'll ask for a couple of volunteers and we'll do a little deep dive into your website live on the screen. But it's lovely to actually have that dashboard to see when a customer comes in, what page they come in from, where they travel through, but more importantly, where they drop off. Is there that little bottleneck? that they can't get through and you're losing sales as a result of that. So the .ie domain bring out a survey um, pretty much every year. And there's some really interesting statistics in it for this year. Um, and basically it's 69% of consumers say it's frustrating if a company does not have a website. Now this is pre-COVID. And 69%, whether you are a bricks and mortar retail store or you're a uh, a distributor selling products and services wholesale, not having an online presence, people find it really frustrating. Why? They're looking you up. They're trying to find your opening hours. They're looking for reviews. We won't buy something until we see somebody else has bought it first and we want to know what they thought. Because lots of people, when they're looking for your products or services, may not know your business at all. They're hearing about you and finding you for the first time. So they're looking for those recommendations. 63% of small to medium enterprises do not promote their website online. I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive into that this morning because you have, you could have the most amazing business, but if you're not telling people about it, you have no business. Unless people know about you, you don't actually exist. Now, people will search, so they may not know you, but they could be looking for products and services. So I'm going to talk about search as well. But primarily, what if people don't even know that your product and service exists and that they need it? They won't search for it. So this is where 
social media comes in where you can advertise and target specific demographics and then your ad for your product or service appears. And then when you get them to come to your website, either by them searching or by you running a, a social media ad campaign, what happens when you get them onto, their site, onto your site? Well, only 40% of SMEs with websites can take sales orders online, take payments. This is completely unforgivable in 2020 because it's never been easier. With the like of Stripe, Stripe PayPal, Elevon, WorldPay, any of those payment gateways, it's never been easier to take a payment online. Everyone's website should be able to take a payment. Everyone. It doesn't matter whether you are a local sailing club, a, a local distributor, a sole trader. Um, the ability to take a payment online is imperative. You can send invoices out, but have a, a page on the website where they come, enter your, their invoice number and pay directly. We like that convenience. When's the last time you queued for your road tax? We don't do it anymore. Motortax.ie, go in with your, um, your reg plate and your little pin and you can pay online and then it's posted out to you. We've got used to that kind of service. Everyone in the room should have the ability to take a payment on their website. And 32% want e-commerce training. So I'm going to kick that off this morning. Now, I wanted to really make this point. I often do this in, in all the training that we're, we deliver, um, both with the local enterprise offices and Enterprise Ireland and, and working with corporates as well. It doesn't matter what the online presence is. So let's talk about social media for a minute. Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever it is, every single one of those platforms are exactly the same. Every single one of them. Let me clarify that. To use them, you log in with a username and password and you're presented with a box. Every single one of them, big box like I have on the screen. You post in it your content, your text, your images, your video, and you press post or submit. Every single one of them. It's a box. You type in it, you click post. Website design. Let's talk about some of the, the four big ones. So we're talking about Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, WordPress. Every single one of them are exactly the same. You log in with a username and password. You go into edit mode. You move your mouse around the screen and they all turn into boxes that you can edit and place your content in it. So now website design has changed. It is a box. You type in it. You click post. So social media content, website content, every single one of them, to use them, they are a box. You type in it, you click post. Here's the question. What do you put in the box? What do you put in the box? And your web designer will help you, but they won't know you and your business. Only you know your business better than anyone else. So you've got to come up with the content for a web designer. If you're using your social media platform, you have to come up with the content for the platforms. If you have people doing it on your behalf, you've got to sit down and have that chat because they're going to guess about what it is you do, how you do it, but more importantly, why you do it, the cause and the belief. And I'll be delving into that later on. But I wanted to, to um, kind of analyze what we like and what we don't like. So I'm going to ask you, if you do have your mobile phone with you, I'm going to ask you to uh, take it out now if you can. And uh, I'm going to ask you to go to a website and I've thrown it up on the screen. So we're going to make this interactive. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and you'll see them appear live on the screen. So menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And then it'll ask you to put in a code. And the code is 592300. So I'm going to ask a couple of live questions. Uh, you'll see this go up live on the screen. And uh, let me click it up for you here now, straight away. So there we go. So menti.com. I'm putting the code 592300. 
So menti.com 592300. I'll leave that up on the screen so um, a few people can take the time to do that. So great if you have your mobile phone handy. By the way, if you're on the one device and you're watching on the mobile phone or a mobile device, that's okay. Um, press the home button. You won't lose me. Um, it'll just go into the background. You can open up a browser and then go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I dot com and put in 592300. Okay. You'll know you're on the right page there when you see uh, the... Uh, the infographic for this morning. So let's ask a, a, a question. I want you to think of a really good communicator, somebody that you admire. Now, don't put in their name. I want you just to think of them. So this could be a family member. It could be an actor. It could be a politician. It could be your pet, like they're a good communicator. But as you think about them, what qualities, in your opinion, do they have that make them a great communicator? So on the screen in front of you, you'll have three little boxes and you can put in one word, you can put in a phrase, but it, one word works really well if you're thinking about attributes and it's a word cloud. So you'll start to see live the words appear on the screen. The more people that use the same word, the bigger it gets. Right? So we'll get collectively what we agree on as 136 people in the room, what we think contributes good communication. So I think of a great communicator, somebody that you admire, in your opinion, what qualities do they have that make them a really good communicator? So we're getting, they're knowledgeable, they're relatable, their body language, their values, they listen, they're warm, they're authentic, they're clear speaker, they're authentic, is in a couple of times, authenticity is there. They've empathy. What they say is useful. They have a presence. And then we'll go for the big words that are starting to appear. So the bigger the words, the more people are saying them. So they're passionate. They're relatable. They're knowledgeable. They're confident. They have a clear message. They're informative, authentic, honest interesting, the warmth. But the big ones, as we hit 100 people responding so far, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, the number goes up. That's the number of people that have responded. So we've just broken the 100 mark with the next one. And we've got honest, clarity, they're engaging, they're clear, they're informative, relatable and authentic. So ladies and gentlemen, if we were to grade somebody from zero to 10, if they had these attributes, the big words that are popping up, we would score them a nine or a 10, wouldn't we? You'd put them up at the top of the scale. Okay. So let me go down the other end of the scale. I want you to think of a poor communicator, somebody that you don't admire. Now, normally what happens is when we do this in a live audience, the word Trump comes up here immediately. So. If that's who you're thinking of, don't put their name in. But as you think of them, in your opinion, what attributes do they have that do not constitute good communication? So think of somebody that when they communicate, you don't really admire them. So it could be a politician. It could be a movie star. It could be a family member. It could be a work colleague. It could be somebody that you know that they have attributes that you feel are of a negative connotation when it comes to communication. So in your opinion, what are those attributes that do not constitute good communication? They're a mumbler. I love that word, mumbles. It sounds exactly as it means. I mumble, mumble, mumble. So they wander off the point. There's a lack of trust. There's no eye contact. They're cold. They're complicated. They have a vagueness. What they say is irrelevant, they're shallow, they're disagreeable, they're too loud, they're too insincere, they have a lack of confidence, they don't share knowledge, they don't listen to anyone, they have a lack of trust, they're very dismissing, they're inauthentic, they're hesitant. And then I'm going to go for the big words that are starting to appear in the middle. 
They lack confidence. They're shifty. They're hard to understand. They're confused. They ramble. They're cold. They're repetitive. They're aggressive. They're untrustworthy. They're a spoofer. I love that. It's very Irish. It's a spoofer. They're boring. They have no eye contact. They're dishonest. They're unclear, arrogant, vague, and confusing. So ladies and gentlemen, there's our scale. So in other words, I asked you to think of a really good communicator, somebody that you admire. And these, in our opinion, out of a hundred odd people in the room that we were able to answer the, that. And by the way, if it didn't work for you, that's fine. I know we have 136 and 106 answers there. It's great. It's a, it's a kind of a snapshot of the room. But we would put people with these attributes up at the top of the scale and score them a nine or a 10. If people had these attributes, we would score them way down and give them a zero or a one or a two. This is what we recognize collectively, the people are in the room, as a poor communicator. There's your scale from zero to 10. So what am I going to ask you? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Where are you on the scale? But I'm going to ask it in a really interesting way. And I want you to think from an online point of view, your clients and your customers. So in your opinion, where would your colleagues, where would your clients, where would your customers, where would your family members place you on the communication scale? We recognize what's a zero. We recognize what's a 10. I want you to be absolutely honest. This is a completely anonymous poll. So we're going to get collectively a measurement, an average of the room of where we feel we are. So in your opinion, where would your colleagues, your clients, your customers place you on the communication scale? And we'll get an average uh, of the measurement in the room. So we're at 70 already and it's flying We're nearly up to 80. And we're running an average of 68%, so 6.8 out of 10. I'll finish that when it gets to roughly the 100 mark. So we're about eight or nine to go on this. So it won't move too far from that, I think. Now, you know what? 69% is not bad. If I got that in my leaving cert, I would have been uh, very happy. So it's hit the 100 mark and it's just dropped one, one uh, point decimal to uh, 6.8. Not too shabby, but wouldn't it be lovely if collectively after we finish this session, we can move everyone up one notch and move that entire average of the room from a 6.8 to a 7.8. How do we do that? Well, this is all about your online presence. And ladies and gentlemen, if all the social media platforms and all the website designs are a box and you type in it, you click post. And I'm asking the question, what do you put in the box? What content do you put in? Well, we know, you've just told us, we know what resonates with us. In other words, if the content we put in to those boxes are clear, engaging, they have clarity, they're authentic, they're honest, we're going to like them. But if they're the other way, if they're unclear, if they're dishonest, if they're confusing, if they're arrogant, if they're vague, if they're boring, and if they waffle, we're not going to like them. We know what good content is. We just have to do it for ourselves. I love the no eye contact one because one of the things that has happened quite a lot is and you'll see people doing video messages, you know, talking to camera. Um, either them or an evangelist, um, a, a, an influencer, somebody who has bought their product or booked their service. Um, and it's a lovely thing to do because the power recommendation is there. If you can get a testimonial, somebody take your mobile phone out, film them and put that up on, on a screen. We do like that. Why? Because it has those attributes. It's honest, it's clear, it's engaging, it's authentic when we hear somebody else say, we're brilliant. It's not authentic when we say we're brilliant all the time. It becomes arrogant. It becomes uh, as if you're a spoofer. 
right? You don't, you think you're brilliant, but not everyone else does. And I saw the words there. So that's our scale. And when we finish the session today, I'm going to ask you one more question. And we won't, we'll come back to this, but I won't ask it yet. But it will be, what one thing will you do to move up the scale? And we're not going to answer that one yet, but we'll come back to it later on. So I want to move to the, the online tools and, uh, and let's have a, a little wee chat. So what I, what I really want to do from the whole part of today is I want to talk about two things. From a business point of view, if we're restarting Fingal, your business, with your audience, your clients, your customers, how do they find you online? How do they find you online? So we're going to do a little bit of search engine optimization. Three small tips in three minutes, and I'll give a live demo. We're going to go live into the audience. I'll, I'll take one or two volunteers and we'll go live into your website and we'll have a, a look at it and a deep dive. But the reverse of it is, how do you find a new client, a new customer, a new audience? How do you become that authentic person and engage? Engage enough that they click and travel to your website to look at your products and look at your services and ultimately maybe make a purchase. When's the last time you used the Golden Pages? Do you remember it? About 9, 10, 11 years ago, if you were not in the Golden Pages, you were not in business because that's how we found people. So your business now, can you imagine having to think of a category to put it under? Some of you will have different categories, more than one. And then that's how people found you. They went to the book, they looked up the category, and then they went searching. And many businesses were trying to be clever and think of new ways of being found. So what they actually did was they changed their business name to A-A-A-A-A-A, my business name, to be found first. And then when we found them, we had a Rolodex. I don't know if anyone remembers the Rolodex. You know, imagine going into Eason's now and buying a, a set of blank cards in alphabetical order to put them in. Now that's been replaced by this, by your, your mobile phone. Um, we use the mobile phone all the time. So I want to talk about search and we search and we use Google all the time. So to do that, I'm going to give a, a bit of a live demo and I'm going to use LinkedIn because LinkedIn is just a website. It's a website like any other website that you can use. Um, and it's very similar to your own website. Um, if you think about it. And I'm just having a quick look at some of the questions. This is brilliant. So the questions are coming in, which is great. Sharon is going to moderate them and I'll start taking them um, uh, as a whole all the way through. So I'll, I'll pause, do a few questions and, uh, and we'll be here right to the very end, but I'll get every question answered as much as I can. But, uh, but thank you very much for the, the questions going through and, and Sharon will manage those and moderate them there. But we'll, we'll unmute you as well. If you want to put your hand up later on and ask a question, we'll unmute you and we'll be able to go through it. Okay, so LinkedIn. Now, it is a website, but ladies and gents, I could take anyone here in the room, take your first name, your surname, put it into Google and search. And I promise you, I'll find you on the front page of Google in the top five hits with your LinkedIn profile. How does that work? And this is really important because people buy from people. In other words, I might not know your company name. I'm going to look up you, the person I met at that trade show, the person that did the live Skype call with me or Zoom or GoToMeeting or whatever platform we're using at the moment. So let's do that. Now, there is a small problem. I'm a Mac user. I use an Apple Mac every day. And this is my browser of choice, which is Safari. And the reason I'm bringing this up is when we're talking to companies and I ask them, how easy are you to find? They say, sure, I find myself every day. It's great. Look myself up. It's brilliant. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Your browser remembers what you've looked for. So this is Safari, my browser that I use every day. This is Google. And I'm going to type in three letters and I won't even click enter. F-I-N. And I've looked up Fingal Enterprise Week and a Fingal map. They're in purple. The browser remembers what I've looked for. If I backtrack and go DUB, I've looked up the Dublin City Live Traffic Cam or Dublin Gospel Choir. And all the other things in black is what other people have looked for. So I'm going to dump that. So just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to dump that browser and I'm going to open up a different browser. I'm going to open up Chrome. But I'm going to wipe it clean. I'm going to empty the history from the beginning of time. Now, you don't have to do this. 
This is me just doing it to show you how the system works. So I'm going to wipe my browsing history, cookies, images, everything. Right? So this is a naked browser. Now I'm going to type in google.com. I click enter. It goes immediately to Google Ireland. Google knows where you are and it's expecting you to look for local products or services to you. So it'll start to show those to you. So let's look for a common name. Let's look for John Smith. And we put in location, Wicklow. Top hit, LinkedIn. How did that happen? Well, let's have a look. Let's analyze it. So we go straight in here, John Smith. And you can see here he's an electrical contractor. Now I'm not logged into to, uh, LinkedIn. This is just a public profile. But he says there, John Smith Wicklow. And that's what I looked for. Without those words on the page, he'd never be found. Let's see what else he does. So in the summary, he says he does the maintenance of repair for domestic or commercial installations. Now I'm going to copy that phrase. I want you now to forget that we know John Smith. But we're now looking for somebody to do that product or service to us. So this service, which is the maintenance of repair for domestic or commercial installations, we're going to Google that. Where? Wicklow. Click enter. What will I find? John Smith. Why? Those words appear on his page. Unless they appear there, he won't be found for that search. But there's a problem. And the problem is, John says he's brilliant. And so will you. On your website, you will tell everybody how good you are. You're amazing. You're brilliant. You won't actually say, no, buy from my competitor because I'm not really that good. Here's the problem. We don't believe you. We are expecting you to say that you're brilliant. Let me give an example. I'm logged in here to LinkedIn and now I can see John Smith is a secondhand connection to me. I've 26 people that know John. I will put much more emphasis on what these people say than what John says. So I found him before I call him. I'm going to look at my list and I see Heber O'Farrell here. Heber I bought my first mortgage from. I know him, I like him, I trust him. I'm going to call Heber and ask him, how good is John Smith? How well do you know him? Would you recommend him? And all that happens before I make that call. And John doesn't even know that happens. So the takeaway from that is, ladies and gents, you have got to have testimonials and referrals. You've got to. We will not buy your product or service until we see somebody else has bought it first. We don't trust you if we don't know you. And most of the people that are searching and finding you for the very first time don't know you, but they're looking for other people that have bought your product or booked your service prior to you. We won't, when this is all over and the restrictions are starting to be lifted, and we start to travel again, whether it be a staycation here at home or whether we are brave enough to jump on a, on a plane over the next couple of weeks with our masks on and head off, we're not going to book a hotel without looking at TripAdvisor, especially a hotel we don't know. And we will look at the, the, the gradings and the results. And we skip the five stars. We always go down to the two star to see what people are giving out about because we want to make our own buying decision your client and customer will do that too. So don't worry about negative feedback. Fix it. It's actually much more authentic. And you saw in your word cloud of the things that you value as a good communicator is people that are authentic. So when we see people have all five stars, we kind of don't believe it. We like to see the real world where they've got a three or a four star and we want to see what people are complaining about. But more importantly, we want to see, was it fixed? I love to see a website have a three star review and then them fixing it. I'm sorry, the product that you arrived was the wrong color. Um, we've sent you the correct color and please uh, accept our apologies and keep the other one and hope you can pass it on to someone else. And then they come back and say, that's fantastic, five stars. That's much more valuable. So from a social media point of view, it comes in various different flavors. So some people like Coca-Cola, some people like Fanta, some people like 7-Up. You're not going to know what flavor you like until you open the can and taste it. 
And social media is very much like that. And especially with clients as well, their taste changes and new tastes and new cans arrive. So TikTok has now become a thing. Whereas YouTube was the king of the castle about four or five years ago, still is by the way, but TikTok for little short videos has become popular. Should you use it for your business? Well, only you can answer that question by tasting it. And I would urge everybody that don't dismiss the various different offerings. They change all the time. And Facebook, it's kind of moved away, depending on the demographic now, to more Instagram. And yes, it's the same company, but they're targeting different demographics. So if you're looking to target the 25 to 35 age group, it's probably going to be Instagram. If you're targeting the 35 to 65 age group, it's still Facebook. But that's changing all the time. So my first bit of advice would be, um, think of a strategy. And we see this all the time when it comes to social media. The rush to start to use the tools should never outweigh the need for a strategy. So starting to think about what you're trying to achieve, achieve and who you're trying to achieve it with. And that helps you pick the actual platform. So I want to talk about a strategy and just throw it up. And then I have a small little exercise for you to do for yourself with a small piece of paper if you have it there with you. Now, no, sorry. Would you mind if I come in with a little question for you? Of course you can. Yep. Before we move away from testimonials, what if you're a brand new business and you're just starting out? What can you do to get testimonials or how do you overcome that? It doesn't matter what stage you're at. When we're working with startup businesses, they're going to do what we call trial trading. They'll get family and friends to try their product or book their service, get their testimonials. You know, and a family friend, um, it's more valuable than a family member. And I'll explain why. Um, if I go to my mum and say, mum, what do you think of my website? She go, ah, oh, no, that's amazing. Do you not think it's a bit too pink? No, you're amazing. You're fantastic. Yeah. So we know that your family members are going to say you're amazing. So a family friend, a colleague, the early adopters. So my, my greatest advice is, and this comes back to you, Sharon, because you run a network. Be part of a network. If it's a chamber of commerce, if it's a local networking group, if it's a local BNI, um, if it's uh, whatever it is, that is a great, the local sporting club, whatever, whatever it may be. I'm nodding to Brian Turvey there again. I have to get the sailing mention in, you know. But, you know, when we open up uh, Hoth Yacht Club again, what a great place to go with, um, with that underneath your hand. What's happened in COVID? Here's my brand new website. Here's my new product offering. Would you have a look at it and give me a review, an honest review of what you think? So I, I hope that answers the question, but that's, that's how to kick it off. Great. Thanks, Noel. And it is. And just bringing it back to network for a second, you don't even realize how many people you have in your network until you go out and look. And mindset is often setting your mind to something. So now we know how important testimonials are. Now we can fix our mind on, OK, where can I go? How can I get them? Thanks, Noel. That's actually two questions answered because two people asked that. So thank you. Not at all. And I see Linda say there in the chat that I only have, I only have five star reviews, which is brilliant because it's, it's from zero to five on Google. So well done, Linda. Um, and they're authentic, except from one family member. But it's great. You know, you have to kick those off and start somewhere. So thank you for that. And by the way, I see the websites popping in, which is super. I'm going to go back to those and, and uh, we might have a chat with you. And thank you for volunteering your website. We might have a quick look at some of them. So um, let me bounce back to where we were. So a so social media strategy. What is it? Well, remember I said you have a plan and have to have a dashboard. Well, a social media strategy to define it you have to, first of all, be able to measure it. So there has to be some sort of dashboard, some way of recognizing what works, what doesn't work. And then you can't do everything, so you prioritize one or two things. I often see people have this massive plan of step seven, step 10, step 20. Start with one or two or three. You can't do everything. So prioritize what you're going to do, and then you develop a plan. So on the Monday morning, I'm going to put up a 
uh, a question video. On a Wednesday morning, I'm going to demonstrate the product or service. On a Friday, I'm going to have my favorite post of the week, whatever it may be. But then you decide who's going to control it. Now, I want to pause on this because I see it all the time. A young intern comes into the company and immediately go, fantastic. You look after all our social media for us, our Facebook, our LinkedIn, our Twitter. You're brilliant. Why? You're young. You'll get it. I haven't a clue. And yet you wouldn't give that person the keys to lock up the premises at nighttime. We don't trust them with that, but you trust them with their entire online reputation. So train, you know, sit down, have that conversation that they're going to speak in the tone of voice. The things that we put into that menti form that makes you authentic, the qualities that you have as a persona in business. And I'll talk about the business persona in a second. But this is where social media is different than a website because it's interactive. You engage, you learn by listening. And then it goes around again. So a social media strategy should never be a once-off plan that's just designed and done. It should be a living, breathing document. And that cycle keeps going all the time. So having a page in your diary or on your iPad or something that you can scribble and each Monday you review the week past and you plan the week ahead. You define, you measure, prioritize what you're going to do, develop the content for that week, who's going to control it, who's going to engage, and then you learn and you listen. And it keeps going again. So I have six questions for you. So if you have a piece of paper, here is your simple social media strategy. Who is your customer? Number one. Now, I want you to get specific. So what I mean by who is your customer, give them a name. So imagine my, my ideal customer is Susan. She's aged between 25 and 40. She lives in North County, Dublin, in Rush, Lusk, Skerries, Balbriggan, Ballybuckle, Old Town, Swords, um, and has on average 2.4 kids and likes um, watching uh, cookery programs and um, listening to Michael Bublé. That's one client, customer, ideal customer defined. You'll probably have a second one or a third or a fourth, but get really specific. Who is your customer? My second ideal customer is Sean. He's aged between 35 and 55. He is uh, newly single, divorced, um, drives a, uh, a five series or E-class Merc, uh, likes rugby, likes um, soccer, uh, likes sports and, uh, and doesn't use Facebook. Right. So you get ex really dialed down to as much as you possibly can on who is your client or customer, your ideal client or customer. In other words, if I was to say to you, who would you be your early adopter? So following on from what Sharon said there about who would be your, your first target for a review or a testimonial, think of that person, the early adopter that would just get you and they recommend you to someone else. Number two, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve with that person that you just wrote down in number one? Is it ultimately sales, which generally it should be, but it could be a bit more than that. It could be that you want to make them aware of a product or service because of COVID at the moment, you could be completely shut down. You cannot operate at the moment under the restrictions. So you want to keep them engaged. You want to let them know when you're going to reopen. So if you're a hairdresser, that date has constantly been changed and it was July. Now it's coming back into June and you want to tell them that we're now open for bookings and we're going to put you on a list. That could be what your goal is. Where is your audience? Now, this is not location as in a physical presence. You've already identified that in number one, North County, Dublin, Balbriggan, Scaries, Luss, Rush, wherever. This is the platform. So where is your audience? What platform do you think they use? They're not on social media at all. So just use websites. 
or in social media, are they LinkedIn? Are they Facebook? Are they Twitter? Are they Snapchat? Whatever it may be, have a guess. Have a go, have a guess. So number one, who is your customer? Two, what are you trying to achieve with them? What is your goal? Three, where is your audience? What platform? Now number four, we're getting onto the content part of it. When will you connect? So first of all, putting the content up is one thing, but when will they see it? So for instance, in number one, if you remember, I said my ideal client or customer is Susan. She's aged between 25 and 40 and has on average 2.4 kids. If I post at 10 past nine on a Monday morning, will she see it? Generally, pre-COVID, no. She's on a school run. So thinking about, not just about the platform, but when is a good time to connect? And those of you that are using Facebook or using any of the online platforms, you get insights, you have a dashboard. It actually tells you when people are online. And generally in Ireland, the biggest hit rate is in the evening between seven o'clock and about nine, 10 o'clock in the evening. It peaks at that stage. And traditionally, that's always been the case. Five is probably the most difficult question you will ever answer. It's why. Why should they choose you? What makes you different than your competitor? Why would they go to you over the person who does exactly the same thing that you do? And I know you're saying they don't do it exactly the same thing. Well, this is why I'm asking you the why. Identify that. What makes you different? Because that's your message. That's what you're going to put in to engage. I mentioned the porthouse and the restaurant. That was their why. You can't come to us. We'll come to you with the full atmosphere. Get that into a post and get somebody delivering a testimonial of them experiencing it. And it has much more value. And then six is how you will engage. That is interactivity. And this is the big thing with social media and why it's different than a website is because people have the opportunity and the occasion to interact with you, to ask a question and they demand an answer. There's nothing worse than asking a question on a Facebook page and no one answers it. So you do have to engage. So those six questions, who is your customer? What are your goals? Where is your audience? When will you connect? Why they should choose you? And how will you engage? And that becomes the backbone of every single social media strategy. And if you've never seen one, here's one, right? So um, if you have a screen grab, you're very welcome to, to take a picture of this. Um, we can organize for these slides to be sent on later on. And I know the session has been recorded as well. So this is a very simple matrix. And, uh, and based on those answers, you can kind of create a, a social media plan. Now, we generally do three things online. We follow, we create, and we engage. So if we're to look for event coverage, so if there's an event taking place in September and you're planning for it at the moment, who do you follow? What do you create? And how do you engage? So first of all, who do you follow? From a social media point of view, you're going to follow those interested in attending the event uh, on media. You want to follow them and you want to engage with them. So what do you create? Well, event information, updates, behind the scenes coverage. People love to see the behind the scenes coverage. Updates on the events. We're nearly ready to open. We're getting the stage ready. We're getting the floor cleaned. We're getting the new social distancing boots designed and ready to go. And then how will you engage? Set up Q&A sessions, a little tweet up session, a live Q&A. You talk to attendees, ask and answer questions. We love that. If we go down to promotion and sales, who do you follow? Current and potential customers, those interested in similar products. What do you create? Links to online promotions, insider information, discount codes, anything that people will like to receive. And then how do you engage? You check replies to your direct messages, you answer questions, and you provide information when needed. So that's the free content. So when you go onto any platform, it's easy to put stuff in the box, but 
that isn't how they make money, the social media platforms. The only way social media makes money is by advertising. That's their lifeblood. Every single social media platform makes money from you when you advertise using them. And it is a very powerful tool. And I want to explain why. Ladies and gents, social media changed the way traditional advertising works. And I'll explain what I mean. Now, it doesn't replace it, it complements it. Newspapers, billboards, radio, television, leaflet drops. Traditional advertising. Every single one of them. You pay in advance and you hope for response. Every single one of them. Social media is completely different. The ads appear for free and you only pay when you get a response, when someone clicks it. So let me dive into that a little bit. Newspaper, okay? So if you go on to a, uh, and you're looking to run a back page ad on a newspaper, you've got to choose the newspaper, whether it be a local or a national, the target, the demographic you're trying to go after, and then you've got to decide on the content, and then you pay in advance, it's published, and you hope for response. Leaflet drops, you decide on the location, the housing estates, the roads, you design the leaflet, the content, you pay in advance for it to be delivered, it goes to the letterboxes and you hope for a response. Billboards, you choose the motorway, the road, the gable end of the house, you decide on the content, you get it printed, you get it put up and you pay in advance and you hope for a response. Exactly the same with radio and television. You choose the station, you choose the time, the show that best targets your clientele that you're trying to target. You get the ad designed, you pay in advance and you hope for a response. Facebook, Google, you put the ad up for free and you only pay when someone clicks it, when you get a response. Let me give you an example. This is Kenny's Bookstore. This is the oldest online bookstore in Ireland. Not the oldest bookstore, but the oldest online bookstore. And this is their website. And right about now, they're trying to shift content and books, pallets of books that they have left over, either from Christmas or just because of COVID happened shifted. So it is a website. They have a very unique value proposition. Millions of books, free delivery worldwide. They will post a book anywhere on the world, anywhere on the planet, the price you see is the price you pay. There's no postage on top of it. But let's find a book that they're trying to shift and they'll probably have discounted it. And let's see how they could shift it. So here we got one on Norse mythology. It's 20% off, it's now 13.95. We wanna drive people to that page to buy that book. How do you do it? Facebook ads. Three million people in the country, but we don't want everybody. We just want the people who like Norse mythology. There are 33,000 people in Ireland on Facebook who said they like Norse mythology. And your ad for that book, if you're Kenny's bookstore, will appear on their Facebook feed and their Instagram feed for free. You will only pay if you're Kenny's bookstore when they click it. And what happens when they click? It goes to the website, not to the front page, but to that page that you selected to buy that book. It's a new way of hunter gathering. But for that to happen, creating the ad, the box is simple. The content that makes people want to click is the difficult part. And that's where we're going with the content. It's a box, you type in it, you click post. It isn't just what and how you do, it's the why. So let's delve into this. The other aspect is search. So hunter gathering, we can run ads, but then people might be looking for your product or service and they'll just use a search engine. And generally it's Google. So I wanna give you three tips, three minutes, and then we go live into the audience and we'll pick a couple of websites that were put up into the chat and we'll unmute you and we'll have a, we'll have a little go at this. So number one, you say what you do in text. Google 
is blind and deaf. It cannot see pictures, it cannot hear sounds, it can only read the words on a page. You saw me look for John Smith Wicklow. If those words did not appear on that man's LinkedIn profile, he would never have been found in my search. Say what you do in text. If you are a plumber and you're based in swords and you specialize in emergency callouts for leaky pipes and gas insulations, those words need to be on your page for the day that someone searches emergency callout plumber swords. But also you will deal with Pope Marnock, with Malahide, with Hoth, with Sutton, with Blanchestown, with Rush, Lusk, Balbriggan, Dundalk, Drogheda, Galway, Limerick. If somebody's looking for an emergency call out plumber for gas insulation in Dundalk, unless you have those words on your page, you're never going to be found. And it doesn't have to be your front page. It can be any page on your website. And this is where a blog comes in. Blog sounds like a dirty word, doesn't it? It's news. So a little news update. A blog post once a month, so you're doing 12 a year, it gives massive value. So if you're talking about the last job you did, if you're a plumber, and talking about that client that had that need for the emergency call out in Dundalk, gas insulation, and you're describing the job and the outcome, those keywords are there when someone searches. So number one, you say what you do in text. Now, some of you may be redesigning your website and want to book a new domain name. You can use that as an opportunity too. It doesn't have to be your trade name. You can say what you do. So I could be O'Sullivan's Kennels, but my website is called ibuildkennels.com. And you'll see quite a lot of the business, sometimes a happy accident that they've had to do this because the name was gone. B&Q would be a good example of a happy accident. So their website is DIY.com. So they couldn't get the B and Q because that little and, that little figure eight and doesn't work. You can't use that in a URL. So they said exactly what they do. They bought DIY.com. And if you look for anything DIY, you're going to find B and Q on the front page. So number one, you say what you do in text. Two, active updated content. You can have a Michelangelo designed piece of art of a website, but if you're not updating it regularly, Google doesn't know whether you're live or dead and it's going to stop sending you traffic. And we see this all the time. A nine, 10, 11 year old company are doing great for a while and then a brand new company finishes a start your own business course with Fingal Local Enterprise Office and they set up in competition and their website is killing it in search. They're appearing above everyone else. Why? They're new, they're fresh, and they're updating their website. I'm often brought in to consult with the existing business. And my first question would be, when's the last time you updated your website? And the answer generally is, my God, it's at least four or five years now. Problem solved. So how often do you update your website? Well, if your nearest competitor is updating their website every three to four weeks, you've got to equal that or better it to beat them. You say what you do in text, active updated content, and lastly, number three, links. Links are really important. So let me explain what links are. Well, first of all, they are the roads that Google travels on or any of the search engines. They all have crawlers or robots and they thrall the internet 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They will arrive on your website on average every five to seven days. They'll scan each and every page, scan it, index it, take a snapshot, and then they start following the links. So if you look on an average website, you're gonna have a menu bar on the top, home, about us, contact us, product services. Each one of those is a link. You click it, it'll bring you to another page within the website. Google can see them. They're the roads it follows. And sometimes, other than internal links, you may have external links where your website links to your YouTube channel, your LinkedIn profile, or an article on the Irish Times where you've mentioned. And if those sites link back to you, 
oh my God, Google loves you. Why? You've created a motorway rather than a cul-de-sac. It needs those roads to travel. So those three tips, you say what you do in text, active updated content, and links in and out, and amazing things happen. So Sharon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bounce into the chat. My God, it's busy, isn't it? Okay. Let's see. I'm going to go right back and see if we can find. Um, um, no, someone. before before you dive in, can I ask you a couple of questions that have yeah. come in? And I tell you, you be spoiled for choice. There are plenty of websites in for review. Lo loads of brave souls. Fair play. Um, so first of all, is blogging the only way to update or is blogging the only way to update? Is there any other website content you can update? So what else drives Google? So any content drives Google. It is the easiest way to update for a reason. When you build your website, the core content doesn't change that much. So my about me section is not going to change that much because my, I don't change. And um, my products don't change that much. So here's the products, there's the price, there's the colors. They don't really change that much. So there's two areas that can be updated regularly. Number one is a blog. It's like the news items. Yeah. Number two is the reviews. You can add reviews on every product page or any service page. So you should be collecting reviews regularly and updating your website with them. Okay. So that, that's my top tips. Brilliant. And I see there's a, a new question that came in that's similar. Do we need to update the home page with new text news regularly or will the blog news page keep it fresh and high on Google rankings? Any page within the site will keep it. Yeah. Um, and you'll see me do that in a second. So if you go on to the local enterprise office, actually, let's do this. Let's go live on it just before I pick somebody else's uh, page out. So mm -hmm. let me throw this up on the screen. Let me grab a, a, a browser really quickly. So here we go. You should be able to see that. So let me bounce in here and I'm going to go to local enterprise, bingo. All right. So ladies and gents, this is the local enterprise office website. You've all seen it. You've probably booked um, some courses and content on it. And I would advise you, by the way, please keep an eye on it. It's updating nearly on a, an hourly basis, never mind a, a daily basis. Alvaro and the guys in the back are doing an amazing job. There is a blog on that website. It's not called blog. There it is. It's called news. And if I click in on it, each one of these is a blog post. So if I go back to page 25, completely at random, right? And let's go to Fingal Company, Hope Beer wins National Startup Award, right? So this is going back a little bit. It's uh, 2017. And if I take any phrase out of that, so let me see and say a craft beer company from Fingal has won. And I'm just gonna grab that phrase, right? So let's go to Google again, and let's look for that phrase really quickly. A craft beer company from Fingal has won, and I search for that. What will I find? There's the blog post, the top hit. And Google then will find other words that you looked for, so we can find Hope Beer by their Google listing on the map. So once you put the blog post up, Google will help you with everything else. So a blog post is a super thing to do, if that's okay. Okay, great. Um, another quick one here, which I think a lot of people will be interested in, you know, because you've talked a lot about the power of reviews. Any website or any apps or review kind of tools that are helpful to add to the website? I know I've seen Trustpilot around, stuff like that. Yeah, the big ones are always good. Trustpilot is, is one of the big ones. Um, but I like them to be authentic. And, and that was one of the words. It's, so what makes an authentic review? Well, words on the page that you've got from an email review are lovely. They're great. The problem is, though, you don't see a picture with them. So to make them more authentic, if you have a picture of the person that gave that review, um, that gives really good value. But actually a video as well. If you have a video testimonial from somebody, that's massive. You know, where somebody's saying, this is amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you to whatever the company name is. Yeah. So um, they do matter. Yeah. 
brilliant. Yeah. And I certainly found that even I remember in local enterprise week, we got a few businesses to say, you know, this is who we are, this is what we do. And we're really looking forward to coming along to the Restart Fingo webinar or whatever it is. And that was one business saying to other businesses, we're coming along, coming along and we hope that we'll see you there as well. Quick question on videos, no. Um, obviously, usually there's no text attached. You can, of course, put the subtitle in there, but in terms of Google reaching out and finding the video, how does that work? Well, you've, you've actually just uh, question answered there. Um, Google's blind and deaf. So I want you all to imagine you go onto YouTube and you're looking for a video. What do you type in? You're typing in what you're looking for. So I'm looking for a review of a Skoda Octavia. You're going to type those words in. Skoda Octavia review. The person that created the video, if they didn't describe that that's what the video is about, the video will never be found. So you've got to say in the title, Skoda Octavia video review, in the description, and you'll find that all the time, that um, if people do it, the video is found. If they don't, it'll never be found because Google is blind and deaf. So every video and images, by the way, I'm going to do that in the live demo here. So um, videos, yes, descriptions, but images as well. So let me go down here. Um, let me see. Okay. So I've got Smoothie Bikes and I've got New Fields. So um, Dennis, you put in newfields.com. So I'm going to see if we can find Dennis. Let's see. There's Dennis. I'm going to unmute you, Dennis, and, and get you to say hi. How are you, Dennis? Are you well? How are you? How's things? <laughs> Thank you for volunteering. This is great. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. No, thanks for picking me. <laughs> so Dennis, what I'm going to do is um, let me just throw up Google. And, uh, and we'll go on a little bit of a, a customer journey. So Dennis, um, what would your client or customer type into Google to find you? So I want you to put yourself in your client or customer's shoes. You know what your website is. They don't. They, they haven't even heard of you before. Yeah. What would they type in to find you? Off you um, go. I suppose uh, microgreens. Um, that's what my business is based around. Uh, Microgreens. Yeah. I love this. <laughs> now, you know what? Um, on my oath, by the way, Dennis is not a plant. All right. Absolutely. Because you couldn't make this up. This is brilliant. Microplant too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Boom, boom. I love it. So microgreens. Okay. Yeah. So I put a space in between it. You can see Google is starting to... Uh, to correct me. And you'll see that if you mistype something, it's trying to help you along. Now, Dennis, where are you located? In Hoth. You're in Hoth. Okay. Now, if I do this live, generally in a national webinar, I love when I get somebody from Cork or Galway or Donegal, and I'll tell you why. Google knows where I am. I haven't said where I want to find the microgreens. I've already told you I live in Swords. Watch what happens when I click enter. It'll start to find ads or people close to me. It knows I'm in Ireland. It's found Quick Crop, Irish Microgreens, FruitHillFarm.com, uh, The Ethical Gardener, The Micro Gardener, and then Wikipedia. And Dennis, you're going, I haven't found myself except up the top. So yeah. Dennis, that's you, new fields, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you're paying for that, my friend, aren't you? I am indeed. Yeah. <laughs> That's Google Ads. I won't click on that. That'll probably cost you with seventy quid, will it? Uh, yeah. Well, maybe not that much, but yeah, please don't. <laughs> yeah, it's gas, isn't it? I'm doing the ads, but I don't want anyone to click it because it's going to cost me money. Um, but here's the question, and it's a bit of tough love now, Dennis. You know I love you now, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah. You know what's coming next? Why are we not finding you here? Why are we not finding you in the organic search? Well, let's have a go, all right? Let's have a quick look at your actual website itself. So your, your website is newfields.com, isn't that right? So let's have a quick look. Now, Dennis, I'm not going to go to your live site, all right? So we found you, here you are, and we found you by looking for new fields. I'm going to click this little down arrow beside your website. You might remember in the introduction, I said Google has this robot or crawler. 
It thralls the internet 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it scans, indexes, takes a snapshot and then starts following the links. This is the snapshot, the cached version. This is the last time Google visited your page, which was the 22nd of June, 2020, at 5.57 a.m. So while we were setting the alarms and getting ready to come up and have our breakfast, Google was on your page and having a bit of a gawk and having a thrall. Dennis, this is what we see. It isn't what Google sees. Google is blind and deaf. It cannot see pictures. It cannot hear sounds. It can only read the words on the page. I've clicked the text only version and this is your front page and the words that Google can see. You asked me to search for micro greens. Yeah. You have seven matches of the word micro on the front page, which is great. Now let me go for greens. Two matches. And there is the problem. Yeah. Should be more mentions of greens. But the reason I said you, you're not a plant, and I want to explain where I'm going. Sorry about that. That's an awful pun, isn't it? But uh, I didn't pay you to be here and say that. And I'll tell you why. And this is the tough love. Ladies and gentlemen, I am a chiropractor. I am Ireland's best chiropractor. I am the number one chiropractor in Ireland. There is no better chiropractor in Ireland than me. I am the chiropractor. I discovered and did chiropractor for 18 years and I have a professor of chiropractor. You know where I'm going. Ladies and gents, what would you type into Google to find me? It won't be chiropractor. I can't even spell it. What would you type in to find me? I have a sore back. You say what you do in text. Ladies and gents, I can see all your images. I put you all in the Brady Bunch gallery view, right? Will you put up your hand if you knew what microgreens were? I have some bad news for you, Dennis. Nobody's hands are going up. No one. No one would search for microgreens. I haven't a clue. Is it a small golf course or something? A microgreen. I haven't a clue. Dennis, tell me what microgreens are. Uh, they're... They're basically uh, juvenile. If, if you think of any vegetable, they're that vegetable grown for a week. Um, so they're, they're, they grow really quickly. You can grow them on a windowsill and they're up to 40 times more nutritious than the actual mature counterpart. I want to grow vegetables on my windowsill. Let's go back to your page if I can. It's a bit tough love now, right? So let's have a quick look. Let me bounce... One second, I'm just going to go back of all the screens open. So let me just share that back up again. There we are. So you say what you do in text. Window. Fantastic. You're there, right? So uh, it's available in a kit form, isn't it? Yeah. Right. How long does it take to grow? About seven days? So, yeah, seven to ten days on average. Yeah. One match, seven. Ten days, lovely, not found. So that's grand. Um, but vegetables. One match. Tell me what a microgreen is. Uh, it's a miniature vegetable, or like a juvenile vegetable, yeah. Dennis, um, I know it's dark and you have a lovely dark silhouette there. There's no light, but we'll, not, we'll be able to see what we want you to do now. Dennis, will you put your hand up like this for a second? Yeah, give it a big slap. <laughs> you sell vegetables, little micro vegetables for, in kits for people to put on the windowsills. And you've mentioned the word vegetable once on your front page. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Dennis, do you drive a car? Uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. Have you ever got an NCT done on it? Uh, no, it's, it was actually due this month. So. Yeah. You're going to feel exactly the same when he hands you the sheet, like I've just said, and said, that's a fail advisory. You're just getting away with it. But that's a direct fail. And it's a great thing to do, ladies and gents. And by the way, I'm asking for a big... Do you know what? I'll even give you a virtual round of applause. <laughs> Brilliant. Dennis, thank you so much because everyone else in the room is going now, oh, thank God I didn't put my website in there now. But it's so, so important. You cannot fix something unless you first become aware of it. 
So while the NCT, we might feel it's a pain in the bottom, but if there's something wrong with the brakes, it's good to know about it, you know? So get the test done on your online presence. Um, if I'm to go back, so let's, let's rewind back. Forget about microgreens, Dennis. If you were explaining what microgreens were to somebody who knew nothing about it and the benefit in it, what would you say? Um, yeah, that, well, the, the speed with which they grow. So you, you can kind of, if you have three or four um, trays of microgreens growing, you can pretty much cut out any bagged pre-washed salad leaves from the supermarket because you can just kind of grow a constant supply within a week and basically fill in all those little gaps of nutrition and minerals and vitamins and antioxidants that you kind of you'd, you'd miss and you'd have to work a lot to incorporate like the adult mature versions of the vegetables into your diet as much as yeah just yeah sharon we're recording this aren't we we are indeed dennis you need to get a copy everything you just said there everything you just said there is your first blog post now, I know this is your, your, your front page and we're just looking at the front page, but those words you just used near to be on your page. I, I started to type some of the words that you said. Uh, you mentioned speed. You can grow with speed. The word speed doesn't mention. You mentioned uh, vegetable. You mentioned leaves. No. Uh, you mentioned uh, shop. No, nothing. The benefits. So there's a lots of words there, but one day somebody's going to look for those products, services, those words need to be there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, let me go back for one thing. I, I'm just going to bounce back because the, the website looks lovely. It's brilliant. Um, and we can see visually, when we get there, we see what a microgreen is. The problem is getting there. What's the traffic to your website like at the moment? Uh, like right now? Yeah. Um, well, the last week. Uh, yeah, well, I started running Google ads and uh, Facebook ads, so the traffic's actually pretty all right, but it's the conversion rate then is, is quite low. Yeah, so you're getting people to the site, converting them is the problem. Yeah. But you're getting to your site by paying for them, respectfully, because you're running the ads, isn't that right? Yeah. So what I'd love you to do is pause the Google ads for a week or two, and concentrate on some of the keywords on the site. Now, I know this is just your front page and it's a bit of tough love, but it's a great, it's a great example. Let me just bounce back to the page for one second. And Sorry, Noel, as you're doing that, a quick, hmm. very quick question. Uh, does that exercise only work on the page you have viewed or cached? If Dennis's keywords were shown on his other pages, would that not have pointed Google to his site? Yeah, it would. So the problem was I looked up microgreens and I didn't find them. I found other people first. Why? They use those words more. That's all it was. So it doesn't matter what page you're on. If we did a complete trial of Dennis's site and there's 55 pages on the site, hypothetically, I wonder how often the, that phrase microgreens is used. Like if we're to look on the front page, um, greens was only mentioned twice and that's why we didn't find it now in fairness to him so there's green the word green is only twice on the front page so um by the way thank you again dennis it's a, it's a great example um it could be and, and to be fair to you it's probably mentioned 60, 60 times throughout the site but it wasn't enough it's not enough my next question is when's the last time you updated the site uh, uh just last week actually good man uh, yeah. yeah. And, and the reason I know that's true is because it says the 22nd of June, right? So it was only two days ago. So to put, to put that into context, rte.ie forward slash news. So RTE's news page. How often does Google come back to us? Every day? Every hour? Every couple of minutes? Yeah. Why? It's being updated every couple of minutes. In other words, if I said to you now, did you hear there was a massive hailstorm and blizzard in Letterkenny this morning? If you were to Google that, you will never find the news article unless Google has found it first. That's it. So this afternoon, the minister, I think, is going to announce um, the opening of the 
airports from the 1st of July, possibly, hypothetically. That's what the rumour is going to be. If that news conference happens, the reporters report on it, they post it online, you will not find those unless Google has found them first, if you search for them. You'll find them on your social media feed if you're following the people that report about them, if that makes sense. Dennis, thank you so much indeed. I re really, really appreciate it. You give me a lot to think about. <laughs> That's the whole idea. That's the whole idea. Now, let me move on down. And thank you again. Um, let me see. Okay, Caroline Hickey, mspace.ie. So let me fee see if I can find you. I'm just, it's like the lotto. I'm just drawing them out here. So, uh, Caroline, how are you? You're very Hi. welcome. How are you? Thank you. Now, do you know, I, don't, I must be picking the people that are all silhouetted and dark, but there you are, Caroline. Apologies. Sorry, um, sorry, I put the light on. Don't worry, you're grand, you're grand. So what I'm going to ask you to do exactly the same as I did with Dennis. Um, would you put yourself in a client or customer's shoes? Tell me what we would search into Google to find you. You would search uh, co-working space in Malahide or remote working in Malahide. Now, brilliant. So I'm in Swords, all right? And I'm going to use you as an example in this one, Caroline. I'm not going to put in Malahide just yet, but you're okay. right to say that because that's what I'd look for. So I'm looking for a co-working uh, space, all right? Yeah. Now, I want to give this example of location. And Dennis, by the way, I didn't harm, um, delve in on your Google map because you had that big teardrop where you're targeting all of Europe, and I loved it. I'm going to come back to it later on. You'll know where, I, where I'm going with it in a second. So, Caroline, here we go. Co-working space. I click enter. Google knows where I am. Look at it. Immediately threw up a map of Dublin. It didn't do Galway. It didn't do San Francisco. It didn't do Sydney. It did Dublin because it knows where I am. So, okay. we're going to have the ads, first of all. So, Regis, Glandor, Easy Offices. So, go create. Go create North. We work. And you can see all the big guys because I used a very generic term. I love that you said Malahide. So let's have a quick look. Co-working space Malahide. And it zoomed in on that map, which is brilliant. M space, creative doc and the view. Caroline, is any of them you? M space. M space, brilliant. Now, the reason, right? The reason that she's first, and you can take a bow on this one, Caroline, Reviews. Caroline has five reviews and they're all five stars. It actually doesn't matter about the, the number of stars. It actually means the number. The creative doc have no reviews and the view has only got one. And that's why you're top in the list. The more reviews you have, the more interaction, the more you'll appear on that. By the way, I'm not going to leave this page without addressing the need to be on Google Maps. Ladies and gents, every single person, no matter what your business, should be on Google Maps. And you can see why. Look at the space it throws up. And if you were to Google me, for instance, so I told you I live in Swords, what happens is you put in your address and uh, Google will send you a postcard with uh, a code. You enter the code and then you're live, but you can desanitize yourself. So in other words, I live in Swords, but I said that I deal in Dublin. And I put that space, a radius from the center of Dublin. It doesn't even cover Swords, actually, which is fine. Um, Dennis did it differently. He said, I'm in Ireland. I do France, Germany, Belgium. And you could see it, it, it continued across that way. So let's have a quick look. Well done, by the way. This is good, Caroline. Thank you. And you know, we've been we've been working with a lady um, on marketing, and she is a huge believer in Google My Business and the reviews. So it's funny. We've only started doing the reviews in the last couple of weeks, and we are getting an awful lot more traction on it. I had no, um, I hadn't put any, you know, um, advantage on doing the Google My Business before we were up there before, but it really is so powerful and it's so easy. So anything that we do on social media we are posting stuff on Google My Business as well and getting the reviews up there. So it, it is, and it's so easy to do and you can do it on your phone, you can do everything. So it's definitely a very good way for, I suppose, Google to pick you up as, as well. So 
and it builds momentum and it goes back to what I'm saying is we won't buy something until we see somebody else has bought it first. So it's, it's really valuable and Google puts a lot of weight in it. So let's have a quick look now at your site. So okay. I'm not going to go into the live site, Carol Ann. I'm clicking that little down arrow. Okay. I'll go into the cached version. So the 21st of June, right? So we're three days ago at 11.40 a.m. So 20 minutes to noon, three days ago, Google visited your site. Now, this is what we see. It's not what Google sees. So I do see you have a lot of video and you have a lot of text down the end, which is lovely. Let me go back up and I'm going to go to the text only version. This is all that Google can see. This is all it can see, right? the text on the page. Now, I'm just having a quick scan through if I can, just bear with me. And there, oh, look at this. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, I'm just gonna copy that for one second. Lovely, okay, so let's do it. Now, I'm gonna search, and I, this is only your front page, and, and that was the disclaimer um, for Dennis as well, because um, I don't have the time to do everyone's page, so I'm just gonna use the front page, um, which is the one that Google threw up to me. So we're looking for co-working. So the word co, 43 matches of just co, right, as in the word, hyphen, working, right? So you have that um, in twice with the hyphen. Now I clue co space working, haven't found that. Now, I'm surprised that it's as low. That needs to be bigger. So you do not have the word co-work as in without the hyphen anywhere on your front page, Carol Ann. Okay. Carol Ann. Yeah. You put your hand up like this and give it a slap. <laughs> We're all about co-working space and the word co-work without the hyphen doesn't appear. With the hyphen, it's only twice on the front page. Now, it's tough love, but you know where I'm going. Malahide, right? Yeah, seven matches. So ideally, you should have co-working space Malahide. So let's see the word space. 35. Now we're talking, right? Because it's all about a space, right? Um, and the key is in the words because you call it M space, right? So space appears 35 different times. Now, workspace, twice, right? So co-work, workspace. Tell me what they do in their spaces. Tell me all the things. Why would somebody need a space in Malahide? To do what? To work. To work. So the word work, 33 matches. Now we're talking, right? What kind of work? Um, office work. So it's like not having to work in an office. Yeah, 22 for matches. Months. It's brilliant. So I'm looking for office Malahide, right? It's it's getting good. What else? What else would you do in, in the office? Um what's the facilities? Facilities um an all in price, so it's you, you know, it's no um, hidden cost, so it's you can so, the amount of it. Yeah. Word flexible was in it. Let's yeah. see the word cost. Not not found. You're not talking about cost at all on the front page. Right? So flexible, but what's flexible? Right, the hours. Let me see. We've got hours. Yeah, one match, two or more hours. How about security? Yeah, one match. You can see the kind of things that I'm looking for. And here is the greatest tip to Dennis, to Caroline, to every single person in the room, ladies and gentlemen. Do not let a client or customer out of your sight without asking them that question. What would you type into Google to find me? you will be shocked at what they say. Sure, I don't do that at all. You've got to take their search terms. You're a chiropractor. I'm looking for somebody to work with my sore back. You take those suggestions, those words, and you incorporate them somewhere in your page. So I can see here that you have dedicated desks, private office, be more productive close to home. They're brilliant, but yes, when I asked you to, to um, think about what your client would put in, some of the words were failing, right? It's a lovely way of doing it. Okay. 
you can't you can't change something unless you first become aware of it. So and sorry, just one. Can I go in and look at the space the way that you did it through the cash? Yes, you can. And I can do uh, that. Okay. And I'll show you how it's done. There's a great little website called cashedview.com. And I'm going to just throw it up on the screen for everyone to, to see. So if you go to cashedview.com, okay. you can put in your website there and it will give you a snapshot of the last time Google visited. So I'm going to do this. I see um, Brian is here and uh, I'm going to use uh, HYC, hotyachtclub.ie. Click enter. Let's have a quick look. So the 23rd of June. Now, to Dennis, to Caroline, and to anyone else, why is Hoth Yacht Club's website being visited more recent? It's because it updates it more often. So quite often, this website is updated quite regularly with content, and it can be anywhere on the site, and Google sees it, so it'll come back. So this is the site, right? And these are like blog posts. So every time you get uh, an update, a news update, um, and actually, Brian, I'm going to unmute you there, Brian. How are you, Brian? Hey, no. The double-handed race, when was that put up? When was that post put up? Uh, within the last couple of days, no. Yeah, and, and that's why Google has come back. So, Brian, let's have a quick look, and we'll go the text-only version. You've never seen this before, have you? No, I don't think, um, I may have, but it's a long time since I've looked at it, no, yeah. Yeah. So if we go on down, you can see these are the posts on the top. There it is. And there's the links. Like any of those blue lines are the links that Google loves. So you want to know more, you click that, it'll bring you somewhere. But it's very text heavy, which is lovely. And yet we put so much emphasis on images, but Google can't see them. It can only read the words on the page. And that's just the front page. But what's brilliant is, those news items are appearing on the front page all the time. So the words are changing. So if we're looking for um, sailing in Hoth. What will I find? So let's have a quick look and let's go straight back to Google if I can. And let's say I want to go sailing in Hoth. What will I find? We've got Hoth Yacht Club right on the map. And the top hit is HYC because the word HOT is in it and sailing and the site has been updated uh, quite regularly. So take a bow, Brian. It's working. Thanks, No, One of the things that it occurred to me and I've just spotted in there as well is the, the uh, importance of tagging uh, the images with the right text uh, because clearly uh, um, Google finds that. So even though it's a picture, if you have the right words there behind it, uh, Google will find that as well. So I have a little bit of a live demo on this. Um, Brian, your business, it's medical devices, isn't it? Yes, it is, no. So you, you would have a certain device, and give me the name of one of the devices. What's it called? A bladder scanner. A bladder scanner, right? So we've all been here, right? So if we go, I'm always dangerous looking for medical devices live on a, on a, on a, a page with 100 people in the room, but we'll go for it. Um, a bladder scanner, okay? So this is the search in Google, right? As in the words and the websites and the videos. But actually, as Brian said, these are bladder scanners, the images. Now, I really want to spend some time on this because this is, this is so key. And I, I, I don't want to highlight anyone in the room because everybody will fall down on this at some stage. I'll explain what I mean. Ladies and gents, if you get a photographer to do um, some stock photography for you, or you get some um, stock images, the photographer will give you a USB stick with all the images on it, and they'll all be called DSC127.jpg, DSC128.jpg. Or if you get stock photography, it's Shutterstock157734. Nobody will search for that. Let me look for that, dsc127.jpg. Every single one of these images, every single one of them are different. Every single one, except they've one thing in common. Every single one of them are called dsc127.jpg. Nobody will search for that. In other words, Brian, if you decided to give up medical device and start making garden gnomes, 
and somebody was looking for a mad hatter garden gnome in a black coat, they would never find that image. Why? It's called DSC127.jpg, Katharina Calcutjava. Bladder scanner. Every single one of these images, I promise you, has the description of bladder scanner in it. You can pick out every single one and it'll have those words in it. So exactly, and Brian, thank you. I could give you a virtual hug on this one because the Google is blind and deaf. Every image on your page should be changed from the DSC 127 to what's in it and the location, the words that people will search for. So thank you for that. I'm watching the time. So um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to bounce back into the slide deck and I want to introduce you to uh, an amazing lady. Um, it's, it's such a great story and I, I love sharing it. I want to introduce you to this amazing lady here. This is Ivy Bean. So what the hell has Ivy got to do with search engine optimization? Well, back in 2008, I joined Twitter for the very first time and I didn't get it. Didn't, didn't stick with me at all. So I dumped it. And later that year, I had to go back onto Twitter for a client um, of mine at the time. And then I suddenly got Twitter. Why? I met Ivy Bean. Ivy became a little bit of an internet celebrity as the oldest person on Facebook and Twitter at 104 years of age. You can actually see her handle there in the screenshot is Ivy Bean 104. She used to change it each year. And I just thought she was amazing. Let me explain why. Ivy was in a little nursing home in Bradford in the UK. And all the people in the nursing home were using the technology that they knew and understand, which was pen and paper. So they were writing uh, their, don't pick up a green sheet when you have a green screen to do. So they were writing um, on uh, postcards and letters and, and sending them out to family friends and pen friends. And they were getting a response every six or seven weeks. Ivy was on Twitter. And Ivy was getting a response every six or seven seconds. So what was she tweeting about? The most simplest of things. How much she loved her fish and chips on a Friday night. How much you loved Noel Edmonds in Deal or No Deal. And you can probably see it there on the screen. Looking forward to Deal or No Deal later on today. But every single opportunity that she got to tell people how much she absolutely adored Peter Andre, she took it. She loved Peter Andre and she told everybody about it. And then he came to visit. Welcome to the world of the influencer the testimonial, the referral, all the people that followed Peter Andre suddenly followed Ivy Bean. And ladies and gentlemen, we take that for granted. Your client, your customer, they have a following. It might be two or three people in their family. It might be three or 400 people on their social channels. If they mention you, you now have an influencer advocating for you. In this case, he has quite a following. So her Twitter feed exploded and she'd loads of people to tell about her fish and chips on a Friday night and Noel Edmonds and Deal or No Deal. And Gordon Brown brought her to Downing Street at the time and he was prime minister. So when she passed away, I couldn't let that day go without acknowledging her in some way. I thought she was amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not a trick. You can do this on any browser, on any device, on any continent on the planet, if you go on to any search engine and you type in three words, Ivy, Bean, and Noel, the top hit will be my blog post that I wrote on July 29th, five days to go to 10 years ago, the day after she died. Let me do what I did for Dennis, for Carol Ann, and for Brian on the images. Let me look on this blog post for the words that I search for, like Noel. And there you have it, written by Noel Davidson. How much he enjoyed Noel Edmonds, Deal or No Dale, Ivy Bean. Nobody has written a blog post in the last 10 years with those three words in it. The day they do, they will beat me. They will become the top hit for those three words. How do I beat them back? I write another one. Welcome 
to search engine optimization. You say what you do in text, active updated content, and links, and amazing things happen. So I have a little bit of homework for you all. I, I'm conscious that I want to take a few questions as much as I can in the last 15 minutes. But I have a video that I really want you to watch. Those that know me know at every single occasion I get, I show this video. And there's a very good reason for it. We do three things online. Generally, we call them the three Ps. We protect, we promote, we participate. If I asked every single person in the room what it is you do, you'd be able to tell me 100%. You know what you do. It could be bladder scanners. It could be co-working space. It could be microgreens. You know what that is. It's easy to protect what it is you do. If I ask you how you do what you do, I wonder what you tell me. How do you do what you do? Well, I get up on a Monday morning, I answer my emails, I fulfill the orders. When you figure out how you do what you do, that's easy to promote. And most businesses just do that. And then they wonder why we're not getting sales. This is what I do and how I do it. Buy me. It's not enough. It's not enough. Why? You're the same as everyone else in the same business as you. You're all saying the same thing. This is what I do and how I do it. So there's something missing. When you figure out your why, not just what you do and how you do it, but why? Why do I sell bladder scanners? Why do people need them? Why did I form the business in the first place? Why is co-working space a thing? Why Malahide? Why not co-working in Ballsbridge? Why not co-working in Port Marnock? When you figure that out, that becomes the message. Why are microgreens a thing? Why would you grow vegetables on your, your windowsill? But as you heard Dennis say, the benefit becomes the why. It's sustainable. You can turn them around in ten, seven to 10 days. They're small, they're nutritious, it saves on waste, trips to the supermarket. Your homework is starting with why. And the video I want you to watch is the third most popular TED Talk on the planet. You just give this guy a Google. Simon Sinek. S-I-N-E-K. Simon Sinek. And you'll recognize that. He, it's, a very, it's a really good video. I show it every occasion I can. You only have to watch the first seven minutes. He talks about what we go through as a buying process. And it isn't what you do or how you do it. It's why. So I wanted to show a different video today to explain it. And there's a book that I read recently called The Power of Moments. Um, and this is Dan Heath talking about the power of moments. And he wants you to build peaks and stop filling potholes. What do I mean by that? Well, there are two words that we use in the English language quite a lot, and it's underwhelmed and overwhelmed. What does whelm mean? Have you ever heard anyone say, do you know what? I'm whelmed by that. We don't use it because it means average. We are either overwhelmed or underwhelmed. And what are the things you remember? You remember when things are overwhelming, when they are peaked. Have a look at this. This is Dan Heath, and in your content, everything you put online, you try to build peaks and stop filling potholes. Have a look at this. There's a puzzle about our memories of experiences. Let's call it the Disney paradox, and if you've been to one of the Disney theme parks, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If we were to sample your happiness level at, say, a couple of dozen different moments over the course of your park visit, my guess is that in a majority of those moments, you would actually be happier sitting on your couch at home. It's less humid there, less crowded. You can get a hot dog for less than 10 bucks. But as we reflect on our park visit, it might be one of the highlights of the year. Why is that? Well, psychologists know that our memories of our experiences are not really fair. You know, we don't just take an average of our moment-by-moment -moment sensations when we reflect on our experiences. Rather, we remember snippets, scenes, moments. 
And in particular, there are two moments that we disproportionately remember. The peak of the experience, which is either the best or the worst moment, and the ending. So when we look back on Disney, we tend to remember the roller coaster moments, the sweet family moments, the surprises. But we don't recall that moment to moment sweatiness and irritability. Now, when we talk about creating better experiences for the people we care about, whether that's our customers, our patients, our students, or our kids, what this means is that we're really talking about creating better moments. Great experiences hinge on peak moments. But there's a problem because we're not trained to build peak moments. We're trained to fix problems. We think that to create better experiences, we take a survey and we collect all the complaints and criticisms and we fix those things. But fixing problems doesn't make people happy. Fixing problems whelms people. Not overwhelms, not underwhelms, whelms. If you drive down a stretch of the road with no potholes at all, you're not ecstatic, you're whelmed. If your cable TV functions exactly as it's supposed to, you're not happy, you're whelmed. So if this is the reaction that we want from people, we need to start building peaks. Let me give you an example. There's a hotel in Los Angeles called the Magic Castle. You're seeing scenes of it here. It's not a lot to look at, is it? The amenities aren't that great. Would you be surprised if I told you this is the number two rated hotel in Los Angeles based on thousands of reviews on TripAdvisor? How could that be true? There's a phone by the pool. It's cherry red. You pick up the handset. You hold it up to your ear. Someone answers and says, Popsicle hotline, may I help you? You can order up grape or cherry or orange popsicles delivered to you at poolside by someone on a silver tray wearing gloves like an English butler, all for free. There's a snack menu where you can get Cheetos and Cracker Jacks and cream soda all for free, just for asking. There's a board game menu. There's a movie menu allowing you to check out things for free. There are magicians doing tricks in the lobby in the mornings. You could even drop off your laundry They'll have it done, washed and folded by the end of the day. And now you're starting to get a feel for how this unassuming place could be the number two hotel in LA. Just ahead of, you see that? The Four Seasons Beverly Hills. What this teaches us is something so important. Great service experiences are mostly forgettable and occasionally remarkable. People are willing to forget a lot of average a lot of mediocrity, as long as there are some moments that are special. But those moments don't create themselves. And if we don't invest in those remarkable moments, look at what we're left with. If we want to improve the experiences people have, we've got to stop fixing potholes and start building peaks. Noel, you're on mute there. Thanks a million. It's just to stop the feedback. So sorry about that. When it comes to your content for your website, that's the biggest tip I can give. You know, your social media, your website, you're looking to share the experiences of successful clients and customers, those reviews. So in the questions, and Dennis asked, and thank you, Dennis, for doing that. He says, my website is newfields.com. I'm getting lots of traffic, but it's not converting into sales. Help. So that shot out to me. So that's why I picked Dennis first. Dennis, if you can explain in a very quick video on the page, the benefit of um, microgreens, right? And build a peak. Somebody else talks about the nutrition of them and how brilliant they are for kids, for families, um, for the environment in a very simple 30 second video or less, you'll find that people will get it easier and want to buy more readily. It might be they find the site, but they're not being converted because they don't understand. They're just whelmed. They're not overwhelmed. Um, I'm going to ask the question. I'm, Sharon, I'm just watching the, the time. So I promise I would do this at the end. Um, and that was, I'm going to in, ask you to go back to um, the... Did I delete it? I did delete it. That was great. Let me just refresh it there. There, I got it. So Mentimeter. Um, I promised you that I would 
get you to answer the final question. So if you go back to that page, I'm just going to reload it back in here for a second. Let me just refresh the page. So go back to menti.com. It may still be live on your, uh, your device. So let it just reload at my end and it'll pop through. I'll give you the code again. Yeah, so 592300. And just to remind where we were, and I'll go to the last question. We asked to think of a good communicator, some of you admire, and uh, what were the qualities? And I'll make sure that these are given to you. Um, Sharon, we might, we might be able to send these out uh, as a PDF. I'll create them out as a PDF. So this is what we believe makes a good communicator. Include these attributes in every post or content on your website or your social media. So dial those up. We ask you to think of attributes that doesn't con constitute good communication. Dial these down. Now, ladies and gents, without pointing a finger at anyone, be honest with yourself. We all do this all the time, don't we? We might be a bit unclear. We might be a little bit confusing. The content we put up is boring. It might appear as dishonest. You know, it doesn't feel authentic. Dial those down. We asked you then to place yourself on the scale and we got collectively a 6.7. So here's the question. Based on some of the things that we've done today, what one thing will you do to move yourself up the scale? Now, this will actually scroll quite fast because we have over 100 people. So I'm going to read them out as I can see them. So engage more, improve my SEO, contact my potential customers, check my website pictures, ensure they have text, that they're not just a generic name, tell customers more about my business, be clearer, look at my LinkedIn profile, give it a review, and um, people buy from people. It's a great way to start. Engage, 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 make videos, update my website. I already have that in hand and do more blogs and testimonials. Communicate with more strategy. So actually thinking about what I'm trying to say. Have more clarity. Have more regular content. More keywords, testimonials, and Google reviews. The reason I love doing this at the end is it answers so many questions that you're all asking at the moment. What do I do? Here you go. And you're choosing the answers yourself because you know what works for you, what you'd react to, to someone's website. So update the website, include more green. I love this. Dennis, I think your website's going to probably crash in the next hour because uh, thank you for volunteering. And Carol Ann, I don't think you're going to have any space left. Brian, I'm not so sure about the bladder scanners, but you never know. Somebody might need one. But anyway, thank you for volunteering. And, and it's great that 100 people have seen uh, the sites up live. The other site that I showed you was the local enterprise site itself. My two-hour session with Sharon and you guys have only just scratched the surface. If you want to know more, you can do a course on Facebook ads. You can do a course on SEO. And all the training at the moment is free of charge as a result of COVID. Um, and that's why it's booking out. So it's all been delivered online. And um, we hope to get back to blended learning at some stage and maybe back to a, leave, a, a real live classroom. That's a good while in the future. But you can see that we're making them as engaging as possible. So keep an eye on the local enterprise office website and, uh, and, and have a look at some of the courses. So all the answers that are there, and we've got 80 answers so far, um, I'm going to make sure you all get a copy of that. It'll come out as, as a PDF and you'll be able to see what people answered. And in that, there are really clear tips on what you can do. Pick three. Pick three things out of those that you could do. You know, so add a new section of a blog if you don't have one. Um, look up my website for keywords. Check that they're there. Post more regularly and tell people more what I do and how you do it and why you do it, right? Don't assume they know, as they said. So brilliant. So I have, uh, we're just at the top of the hour. Um, Sharon, I'm happy to stay a, a little bit past the hour and take as many questions a, as we can. But uh, have you got some in text that people have been asking? Great. Yeah, I do have, I was planning like a quick fire round questions for you, Noel. So honestly, we'll keep them short because they're good technical Over. questions. 
our company Google listing address is Donna Bait, but we service the whole of the Dublin area. Is there a way to boost our Google map listing despite our lack of a central location? So what I think they're asking for there is we want to show the whole of Dublin we're open for business, not just Donna Bait. Yeah, so you saw I desanitized my location and had my servicing all of Dublin. So you change your listing to say that you service within 25 or 50 miles of Dunna Base as your base. Um, and you include those keywords. So um, we have been delivering to Athlone, to Galway, to Kerry, to Cork, to Galway from our Dunna Base base. That will cover it. Brilliant. Perfect. So include the names of where you service. Uh, speaking of keywords, how many or what's the minimum amount of keywords per page would you recommend? I'm always asked that in a different way where somebody says, if I go in and change my uppercase T to a lowercase T, does Google see that as a change? It does, but it knows you're trying to cheat. So that's where that question comes in. It loves a paragraph of text. 30 words or more is a paragraph. It's lovely. So four or five words on the page. Yeah, it sees you but it likes little chunks of 30 words of more. And that's why a blog post works so well. It doesn't have to be huge. 30 words is not a lot. It's four or five sentences. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. And actually someone asked a very interesting question there. Is there any way a competitor can go into that cached view and change things around? No, but they can see them. So you can do a mystery shop on your competitor, put their website into the cache view and have a look and see, especially well, if they're beating you in search. Now, and the good news is if you copy some of their more regular search terms and include them on your website, it becomes new content and Google then kicks you above. Mm -hmm. Okay, brilliant. When I post a video, how do I add text to it? So when you post a video, Google is blind and deaf. It doesn't see the video. It sees the little box where the player is. So it sees the text associated with it. If it's YouTube, it's going to be the title and description. If it's Vimeo, it's going to be the title and description. If it's a native file that you're storing on your website itself, and it's not on YouTube or Vimeo, the file name and the words tagged to it, it treats it like an image. So you'll notice on your website, you have that opportunity to change the file name and you can tag keywords to the image. That's it. Brilliant, brilliant. Is there any nifty way of transferring Facebook reviews over to Google or does it all have to be added native by the people themselves? So there is a nifty way. There's loads of plugins um, that will take content from your feed. Unfortunately, Google doesn't rank it. So it looks lovely and you get your Facebook feed appearing on your front page of your site. Great for the user. Doesn't contribute very much to search engine optimization. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Yeah. So you just have to be careful on that. Um, and then there was a question around, can web designer add tags or do you need to save the photo with words? So the, the web designer can add tags. So you, it doesn't matter if your website is full of images at the moment that have never been tagged and they all have the generic name. You can go in and rechange them. So that can be done. You can do that yourself. Um, if you don't know how to, I would uh, pay for an hour of your web designer's time where they show you how to do it and do it with three or four images and then you get stuck in and, and working on the rest of them. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. And then someone has asked me to talk or asked you to talk about hashtags given the limited time, but if you had to throw out something on hashtags, no, what would you say? They're just words like anyone else. So um, Google will find the word with or without a hashtag. Where hashtags originated was in Twitter originally, where if you used a word and you put a little hash in front of it, it became a theme or a topic. So if you were to think back to the golden pages, how somebody found your business, they went to that category. So the hashtag was a category. I wouldn't get hung up on putting a hash in front of every word. Um, it's become a social meme more than anything else. And we used to say, oh my God, hashtag I'm, I'm knackered, you know, or whatever it may be. Um, that was fine. Google's going to see the words regardless. So um, it does give you a category or a theme that somebody can type for that. It's still going to find them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's Google really. And then otherwise on Twitter and that it's a different story. They have their own algorithms on how they use hashtags. Brilliant. Brilliant. I just want to give a shout out here and um, a couple of things. So first of all, if anyone wants to save the chat, because there's been some brilliant information shared and a lot of company have shared, companies have shared their details.
just um, in the chat there, the three buttons there, the three little dots, sorry, the three little dots across from the name there. If you click that, it'll allow you to save the chat and you'll have that and you can go through later. We mentioned before the power of networking, absolutely worth it to connect with people who are here, uh, whether it's on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, you know, I'm, I even just Google, Google people in and, and then you'll find them. Um, the other thing I want to say really quickly, Noel, if you don't mind, because I'm conscious of people dropping off, um, next week, so this has been episode three, next week we have episode four, which is the last in the series of Restart Fingal. It is all about building mental and financial resilience in the new normal. So really this has been a series, obviously being an online presence is obviously huge for your business, but the, the last session is really going to wrap up everything that we've talked about so far. We are recording all of these and they're going to be, they're going to have a little home on the Leo Fingal website called Restart Fingal. So you can go into these at your leisure. And I just want to mention that. So that's Susan Hayes Cullerton. She's a fantastically inspirational speaker. It's happening on the 30th of June at 10 a.m. So I just want to encourage people, I suppose, to um, pop in, save the date and the link will be out shortly. Um, the other thing is that when you save your link, you're going to see um, something interesting there from Denise Dunn. Um, she's from the Herb Garden, but in particular, she's set up a website called Shop Local, and it's where local businesses can add their details. So well worth checking that out. And um, no, all that remains for me to say to you is thank you so, so much. That was absolutely the fastest two hours. I couldn't believe I glanced down and it was half 11. I was like, oh my God, it just flew by tons and tons of value and tips. And I think we learned so much and it's absolutely been reflected in the chat as well. I think everybody really, really enjoyed it. So a massive, massive thank you from Leo Fingal. And I think from every, I think it's fair to say from everybody on the call. Thank you, Noel. You're very welcome. And, uh, and I would urge everyone actually to join next week. Susan Hayes is amazing. She's the, the positive economist is what she's called. So well done, Sharon, for organizing the webinars. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Noel. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.